All right, welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and talk about our last phylum, the chordata, the chordates. And so you will recall um, that just like the echinodermata, these are deuterostomes. And so uh, the anus forms first. Um, and, you know, which is one of a couple of phyla that do this. So there are uh, several characteristics that uh, describe someone in the phylum chordata. For example, um, they all possess a notochord, which is a, a rigid, sort of semi-rigid rod that goes the length of the organism, gives them some rigidity. Um, think about when we dissected the mollusks. They had that pin in there in the, in the squid for kind of the same function. Um, they have a dorsal nerve cord, and so the nerve cord runs dorsal to the notochord, and again, sort of the length of the organism. They have pharyngeal slits, and so these are openings in the throat. Um, they have an endostyle, which is uh, sort of below the esophagus. It's uh, some specialized cells. They have cilia. They produce mu mucus, and it's the sort of thing that would, is helpful for, for uh, filter feeding. And so again, if you think back to like the mollusks and that, when we talked about filter feeders and, and they move currents of water and they have mucus to trap small particles and then you can swallow the mucus with the particles. These is a, uh, the endostyle is a specialized group of cells that chordates have that can develop into a similar structure. And finally, a postanal tail. And, um, and just because it's, uh, you know, postanal, there's not really any sort of like a, organisms have a preanal tail. It's just a tail. Right, just you're familiar with uh, many vertebrates in their tail. And this is just called a postanal tail. And so here's just a diagram um, again showing some of those characteristics. And not all chordates have all these characteristics all the time, but uh, they often display them, you know, in their larval stage and things like that. So, for example, you at one time had pharyngeal slits and you had a postanal tail, and then those didn't develop much further, uh, but you had those when you were a fetus. Okay, here's a figure from your book, uh, kind of showing you the cladogram and the relationship between these groups. Excuse me, yikes. And one thing that this uh, figure is trying to show you is the relationship between the old taxonomy and the monophyletic groupings, all right? And so again, you'll recall that I've brought this point up several times, is that um, we, these days we would like our taxonomy to reflect our phylogeny. And so um, things, uh, a group should be monophyletic. It should include the common ancestor and all its descendants. Whereas some of our original taxonomy didn't do that because we, we had a different philosophy or we didn't realize these relationships or for whatever reason. And so this is a good example of that. Um, if you look at uh, the old taxa, many of them are paraphyletic. Um, and so they have some of the descendants, but not all of the descendants. Whereas in the, the groupings that your book gives, that's the top here, up here, um, you can see the hierarchy of the groups and you can see the shared uh, derived character that unites each of these groups. Now, the old names are really ingrained, and, and so they're still used a lot of times, and so it's tough not to use them. It's, it's tough to, um, to forget these old names because they've been around so long, and, and, and you've learned them in so many different classes. Um, and so it's not really possible to unlearn those. Um, a better strategy is to sort of learn, um, you know, why those names are no longer uh, something that we would consider, or at least understand why different people have different ways of organizing these animals, all right? So, for example, osteichthys, um, is what I talk about, you know, the bony fish. Well, that's not really um, a monophyletic group, you know, it doesn't include all the descendants from the common ancestor. And so that's not, um, you know, that's maybe a name that I might start getting away from. Or, uh, 
what people have been doing more, more recently is just Osteichthyes includes the tetrapods. And so whereas traditionally it just was the bony fish, um, some people consider Osteichthyes to include the bony fish and the tetrapods. And that would be a monophyletic group. Um, so again, um, you just have to understand that, that uh, as in anything in science, you know, we, we argue about the proper way to do things and we use evidence and, and we continually update our understanding and try to, to get a better and better understanding. Um, again, here's another figure from your book. And, and I've mentioned before how much I like these kind of figures because they really help to solidify in my mind kind of picture the history of these groups. And uh, so down at the very bottom, you can see here, first off, our, our outgroup here, the uh, Echinodermata, another deuterostome. And you can see how um, they've been around for a long time and, and their numbers have remained fairly steady over um, hundreds of millions of years. And then, um, you know, the, the ancestor of the core dates was about 550 million years ago. Um, and you can see several of the groups with which you're probably familiar. Um, and so first off, you can see a couple of uh, ancient fish groups here that uh, became very successful, but then rapidly disappeared in the fossil record. Uh, you see things like lampreys, um, you know, which are still around. There's still a few species of these, and there's always been just a few species. And I always think these kind of groups are interesting, where they just... Um, they evolve and then they never really dominate. They never really go away. They just hang around for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, the cartilaginous fish have been fairly steady throughout their history. Um, you see the bony fish, um, you know, there's, they're very numerous. There's 28,000, 30,000 species of bony fish these days. And you can see that we are living in, a, in an age where they are, have rapidly diversified and there's lots of bony fish out there. Um, and uh, you can also, again, you can see the reptiles. You see the big bulge in the reptiles when the dinosaurs were very prominent, and then it, then uh, um, many of them went extinct, and now they're starting to, to radiate out again. And then, of course, you can see our, our clade here. You can see the mammals um, that we have, uh, you know, been around for a while, but really started to, to really uh, become speciose in the last, um, you know, 60, 70 million years. So briefly, let's talk about each of these chordate characteristics. We've talked about the hydrostatic skeleton in things like the annelids. Um, and so the notochord is sort of the chordate version of that. It gives some stiffness and it gives uh, some rigidity to the organism. And in the vertebrates, the notochord um, becomes ossified, which means it turns into bone, and it'll become your backbone. But the remnants of the notochord are the discs between your vertebrae. So the notochord uh, sticks around, but then you get those bones that form around it in vertebrates, or form, uh, yeah, within it. Um, now, if you look at the dorsal nerve cord, um, interesting thing about this is when it develops, it first develops, it's a hollow cord, and it might fill in with nerves later, or it might remain hollow. Uh, and the end of the nerve cord um, really proliferates and swells, and that becomes the brain. Pharyngeal slits, um, again, are, are slits near the throat opening. Um, and so these started as a filter feeding apparatus, uh, something just to allow food in to be, be trapped. Then it evolved into gills for respiration. And then um, these seal up in your development and other terrestrial developments. They become things like the eustachian tubes, so the little tubes that connect your inner ear uh, to your mouth cavity. Um, the middle ear, uh, those all evolved, the pharyngeal slits evolved into those structures in terrestrial vertebrates because obviously uh, we have no need for filter feeding or for gills. Again, I mentioned the endostyle secretes mucus, and it's got ciliated cells that allow it to uh, move the water. And so this is, again, an uh, adaptation for filter feeding. Um, and then later on, the secretions, those mucus secretions from the endostyle became iodine-based hormones. And so the endostyle evolved into your thyroid. 
uh, probably. And so that's where um, you don't, obviously you don't filter feed, you don't have that, but it evolved. Again, this is an example of natural selection tinkering with what's there to make it, uh, you know, existing structure to, to become used in a different way. Uh, finally, the, the post-anal tail, um, you know, you think about, when, when you think about post-anal tail, you're thinking about mammal tail or something, but, but think about the tail and fish which are our ancestors, or we have, you know, a, a relationship with. And so that muscular tail um, gave them the ability to swim very fast and, and greatly increase their mobility. And this is a theme we're going to see throughout the chordates, is uh, greatly increased size and mobility. And so then um, once tetrapods, you know, organisms evolved in the terrestrial realm, uh, obviously, they didn't need to swim as much anymore, but they the tail evolved for other things like, uh, you know, grasping branches or or what have you, um, fighting things like that. And you still have your coccyx, you know, so you still have the remnants of this. Okay, um, so again, if we look at the groups that are here in the chordata, you know, of course, we're very familiar with the vertebrates, and um, and we know a lot about them, and you know, because we are vertebrate obviously there's a couple of other interesting groups that are chordates but are not vertebrates and so the first is the uh, cephalochordata the lancets and so these probably are the most similar to the ancestral chordates so if you go back 550 million years our ancestor probably looked a lot like this and um you can see the filter feeding apparatus in these organisms that evolved into other things in other chordates. And so um, very interesting looking organism. Then another subphylum within the phylum chordata are the tunicates, the urochordata. These are also called sea squirts. And so that's, they squirt water um, whenever they're disturbed. And so what you're seeing here are, again, it's a colonial organism. And we've seen several animals this semester that were colonial organisms. These are colonial organisms, and they share a tunic. And so a tunic is, you know, a, a cape or a covering or something in human clothing. Um, and so all these organisms share this one tunic, and they all share the same X-current siphon. Um, and so these... Again, this is a classic example where you'd look at this and you'd like how, you know, you would not think that we would be closely related to these organisms, right? They, they don't look superficially as adults. They, they don't have much at all in common with vertebrates or any with us. Um, but if you look as larvae, they have lots of these character, chordate characteristics as larvae. And if you look at that development, um, you know, the, they're triploblastic and the anus develops first, and so those things are clues that, oh, they actually are closely related. Then you look at the DNA, the DNA agrees with that. Um, again, these are superficially like a sponge, right? You've got uh, taking water in and, and filtering it and blowing it out, and they're sedentary and, and they're shaped like a sponge, but um, when you look on the inside, they have very different anatomy, right? You remember the sponges did not have organs and, and did not have tissue layers and things. And you can see you've got organs and, and very com much more complex internal anatomy. Um, the tunic is interesting. It's made of cellulose, uh, a type of cellulose that's found in animals. And that's, again, crazy. Like you, you think, well, cellulose, that's a plant characteristic. How did these animals obtain the ability to make cellulose? Probably horizontal gene transfer. Probably um, there was a bacterium that had the ability to produce this. And, and um, if you look at the you sequence of the genes of these and you compare them to bacterium, you can see a lot of similarities. And so, again, this goes back to, to my earlier um, lectures where we talked about uh, you know, genes transferring among species is actually quite common in the animal world, in the biology world, in biology in general. Okay, um, so um, we're very familiar with the subphylum vertebrata, um, and this is an example of a name that's, you know, it's not going to go away, it's been used forever, but it is misleading, 
because they don't all have vertebrae, right? The hagfish and the lampreys don't have vertebrae. They have notochord, but they don't have vertebrae, but they're still considered vertebrates. And so that's why your, your book suggests the name craniata. Don't know. Don't know if that'll catch on. Not really familiar with that taxonomy. Um, but they all have a cranium. So they all have a skull. And so, like I said, if you look at chordates, chordates but in the vertebrates in general, um, what has made us very uh, successful? A lot of adaptations. A um, lot of adaptations to increase speed and mobility. You've got uh, refinement of structures to locate, capture, and digest food. So we talked some about filter feeding, but now we're talking about active predation, not just sitting and filtering the water. Um, higher metabolic rate, which of course is necessary to be, um, you know, to have more mobility. Um, it allows you to be more mobile. It's kind of, uh, kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, the vertebrates developed an endoskeleton. So in the arthropods, we talked a lot about how the cuticle development, the exoskeleton was a, a very significant and explains a lot of why they were successful. They got, they evolved this, uh, tough suit of armor that had lots of advantages and allowed them to just adapt and radiate and, and just dominate. And, and be numerous throughout the world in every kind of ecosystem. Um, the endoskeleton is a lot lighter. And so since it's lighter, it allows for larger organisms. And so you'll remember that um, that was kind of one of the trade-offs, right? Is that most of your arthropods tend to be small and it's because they are limited by this exoskeleton. You can't it's, hard, it's difficult to be large and have a big, heavy exoskeleton. And so um, the vertebrates, you know, just happened upon a different sort of strategy, uh, right? So we're not going to have the heavy external skeleton. We're going to have, you know, an endoskeleton, which is lighter. And so that's going to give us greater speed and mobility. It's just a different, um, uh, a different strategy. Now, our ancestors did have that heavy exoskeleton. They had dermal armor. So you think about turtles and things. Um, uh, but over time, that dermal armor, um, as the endoskeleton developed, that dermal ar armor got uh, thinner and thinner and, and more flexible. And so um, now you see that vertebrates have that endoskeleton, but they still retain characteristics of an exoskeleton, right? So that dermal armor became scales. And, and we talked, when we talked about integument, we talked about horns and, and other exoskeletal elements. And so we do have some tough, you know, exoskeleton type things, but uh, we rely structurally more upon our endoskeleton. Um, and so the endoskeleton um, is segmented and we have segmented muscles. Um, and so this allows for a lot more complex movement. Again, we said kind of a similar thing in the arthropods. You know, when they developed that, that exoskeleton and they had different attachment points and so it allowed them uh, more rapid and more unique types of movements and so, like things like flight. And so, you know, that was an advantage of, of the exoskeleton and we have a similar advantage but in a different way with the endoskeleton. Um, so things like developing muscles to move food. And so when we talked about filter feeders um, and all semester in all these different groups, we've talked about cilia, right? We've talked about these little hair-like structures that beat rhythmically to move water. And then that water, you know, you slowly filter it and collect things from the water. Um, but muscles that can move the food and move, and once you eat the food and to move it through you, it's much more efficient. So that's a physiology upgrade or an anatomy upgrade. Um, those pharyngeal slits evolved from filter feeding then, um, since we weren't, you know, filter feeding and needing the cilia, the pharyngeal slits were free to evolve to other things. And so, um, they evolved into things for like gas exchange. Well, if you've got an increased metabolism, you need to increase gas exchange. And here, here we've got something that got repurposed for that, uh, for that use. Uh, the evolution of the liver and the pancreas. If you'll recall, 
you know, we've dissected several organisms that we mentioned, uh, the digestive gland or the green gland, uh, not really the green gland. Um, the green gland was for excretory system. But the, the digestive gland um, that we saw in the clam and we saw it um, in uh, the crayfish. And, you know, we said it was sort of like a liver, but it wasn't really a liver. But, you know, uh, the evolution of the liver and the pancreas and then their ability to break things down and the enzymes that they create was a huge upgrade. Um, we talked before about uh, hearts and the two-chambered heart versus a three-chambered heart versus a four-chambered heart. And um, again, that with the closed circulatory system increases the blood pressure, improves the efficiency, which allows you to be faster and more mobile and bigger. Uh, kidneys to filter the blood. So we've mentioned several different excretory organs and things that or animals have evolved in order to um, maintain homeostasis and to remove wastes. Um, the kidneys are uh, a very efficient way to do this. And so that was, again, another uh, huge adaptation. Um, new sensory systems, new brains. And so as the, the swelling at the end of the dorsal nerve cord developed into a brain that allowed for much more, and, and you've got these muscles for more complicated movement, um, and so that all helps more with active predation. And so again, the ad advantage of being able to move around and actively prey upon things, uh, you can get a lot more calories. You can be a lot more efficient. And so that allows you to have a higher metabolism and maintain an internal body temperature and things like that. Um, and with a larger brain and with more nerve tissue, you do a better job of sensing your environment. And so you can avoid predators and you can find things a lot better rather than just sitting there and beating your cilia and just, um, you know, slowly filtering the water. Uh, I think this might be one of the last examples here. The neural crest, the ectodermal placoids, and the Hox genes, placoids and the Hox genes. These are all things that are really important in the larval development or in the embryonic development of the vertebrates. Um, and so a lot of the, um, you know, things that evolve in your head, your jaws, your eyes, your teeth, your nerves, your inner ear, that all arises from the neural crest. And I don't know if you remember, um, when we looked at that video of a developing newt and you could see that neural crest that developed. And so this is uh, something that occurs in the development of the vertebrate embryo that can differentiate into lots of different things. And again, um, you've got all these different possibilities that open up. And so natural selection can tinker with all these existing things and, and come up with all these new adaptations. The ectodermal placoids um, are just another uh, structure and development, but again, ectodermal, right? Think about those tissue layers we've been talking about all semester. These are cells that develop from the ectoderm. They, um, I'm not really, I can't remember what they develop into, but the point is, is that these are all things that changed in the vertebrates that al allowed for all these new adaptations to pop up. The Hox genes was also really important for development, and this is a really interesting um, set of genes that are really important in the developing embryo. And so they control the timing of different steps in your development. And consequently, if they mutate and by just, you know, changing the Hox genes a little bit can alter the timing of development, which ultimately can lead to very different adaptations and very different organisms. And these things are probably really important to the development of vertebrates because you see that we have lots of copies. We have four copies, whereas our closest ancestors, the, um, uh, the Amphioxus that we talked about earlier, and um, uh, other invertebrates, they only have one copy of these Hox genes. And so um, by these things being duplicated, allowed for some of those duplicated genes to mutate and modify while retaining the original genes. And so now again, you've got a lot more 
possibilities for development. And so it might have allowed for a lot more innovation. The, the, again, something that we talk about a lot in evolution is that uh, you know, it doesn't take a very big change at the DNA level um, or a big change early in development to lead to big changes by adulthood. And so by having you know, small mutations and things like the Hox genes can really change the development um, within that embryo and lead to new adaptations. And so all this stuff, all these things we mentioned are all probably part of what um, you know, makes the vertebrates um, radiate and be so successful today. Okay, um, so we're going to uh, dissect uh, some vertebrates. Uh, you know, this semester I'm planning on doing fish and pigs, and other semesters we might do other vertebrates. Um, but also, again, we uh, study vertebrates a lot. We know a lot about vertebrates because we are a vertebrate. Lots of our classes will take one of these vertebrate groups and spend the whole semester on it, right? So ichthyology, ornithology, herpetology, mammalogy. This is all taking one vertebrate group and really um, learning a lot of details about that. Um, and so you will learn a lot of specific things about groups as you take those other classes. In this class, we're going to um, just you know look at some of these general structures. Um, so that's the phylum chordata. That's our last phylum of the semester. Uh, let me know if you've got any questions, and I will see you later.